Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that more people are living not only to old age, but living longer in old age. This co-longevity of generations is absolutely historically unprecedented. Then we'll switch to focus on the science, some of the ways in which science has changed. Being a researcher, I'm very interested in what are the issues we're even talking about 30, 40 years ago, and how are we advancing our understanding of the complexities of aging. Then the main part of the, our time together I want to take on uh, focusing on older people themselves, how they're challenging conventional understandings of later life, and then I'll end with some reflections on what it's like from my perspective being someone now who is a senior citizen, talking about the things that I've spent my career, or living through the things I've spent my career uh, focused on. I'll begin first by really anchoring us in a demography of aging, just get a sense of what the issues are, what, what's it looking like uh, internationally, and then we'll, we'll move on, and then end with some consideration of opportunities and challenges, depending on the way that, that one might approach a particular issue. We know there are many, many reports from organizations like the WHO. They're coming out all the time, focused on issues of population aging. This is a current, and many would say urgent, issue that we need to focus on, population aging. Often, when the WHO develops materials, it uses the threshold of age 60. I know as I get older myself, I think 60 is an increasingly meaning, meaningless threshold, but this 60 is the threshold that's used worldwide. And it is important to remind ourselves that within the next couple of decades, 22% of the world's aging took 65 years to go from 7% of our population to 14% of our population over 65. France had a long time. Japan did it pretty quickly within 25 years. But look at the countries on the other side with the green bars. Very, very short periods of time in which to prepare for the aging of their population. So that's an important differential. This is just a quick, and I don't expect to be able to read everything here, but this is the, in terms of the percent of the population, the countries of the world that have, the, they're the oldest countries. Not surprisingly, Japan and Italy are right at the top. We do hear about those countries a lot. Most of these countries are in Europe. Canada does not make this list in terms of these particular statistics. But there are a lot of countries that are older than Canada is, and that's important because we can learn from them. Now, I use statistics where I said, this is the proportion over 60, this is the proportion over 65. That's a problematic notion. It's an assumption we have, but it's a problematic notion. For the first, uh, obviously, it homogenizes Everybody over the age of 60 or 65 is if that's supposed to tell us something about a population. You've got a span of 40, could be 50 years where we're defining a population as aged, and we don't do that for any other age group at all. But now dementia, or Alzheimer's disease, is dominant. A third of the budget of the National Institute of Aging, when I became scientific director in 2004, a third of the budget of the Institute of Aging was focused on research on dementia. We'll read regularly, this is a colleague of mine at UBC, Brett Findlay, and his daughter Jessica, and I had a, quite a discussion with Brett about this line in his book about the dramatic upward trajectory of dementia and Parkinson's, etc., in society. And one reason we debated it, and I encouraged him to sort of tone down the language, the rhetoric of hyperbole, if you will, because we're actually seeing declines in prevalence worldwide, from 8 to 6 percent. Some suggest it's due to higher education, better cardiovascular health, whatever. There's actually a decline in prevalence. We're seeing more cases, however, because more of us are living longer. So more cases because we have more older people who are living longer. They're not dying of a heart attack, they're living to develop dementia. Uh, if I, for some, for some. But it's not as predominant as is typically thought. But it has come to really dominate research and science. What is interesting when we talk about dementia, these first two uh, images here are of a wonderful, wonderful documentary called Alive Inside. It's got a different cover in Canada than the United States. If you can find it, it's about the role of music. Instead of uh, psychotropic drugs, uh, using to, to treat dementia, what happens when you actually give iPods with music that is meaningful to people and you discover the person who is alive inside 
who may not have actually spoken uh, for the last couple of years. There are books like Kathy Norrie's The Long Hello. She lives in North Vancouver. She talks about the things that were positive and that she learned from her relationship with her mother uh, as, she, as the mother developed dementia. And of course now we have a dementia strategy in Canada that was launched last year. So there's, that's all I'm going to say about dementia, by the way. But, but it just gives you a sense that it's become more prevalent, but even as we move forward, some of our thinking is actually changing. So in AJ, uh, it, what's been quite interesting for, for me to observe, this is an article by Abbott in Nature in 2004, He's talking there about moving away from an understanding of aging in terms of disease. Let's move away from research that's dominated by conditions such as Alzheimer's. Have a rec recognize the need to move broadly to focus on environmental factors, genetic factors, and to think more about the issues that are relevant to people as they move into their 80s, 90s, and beyond. So the new science of aging as it's promoted, this is some research coming out of the UK, one of the areas of the world that is older than Canada. There's a lot that we can learn. A new science of aging that is more, if I would put it this way, horizontal in its thinking. It's not disease by disease by disease. Horizontal, what do all these diseases have in common that relates to aging? A more preventative approach. So this has led to the emergence of what is called gerosciences. And I applaud McMaster University because the chair that Parminder Reyna holds at McMaster is actually a chair in general sciences. So McMaster was one of the first universities in Canada to actually say, we need to have this broad, you know, not discipline-based, but cross-disciplinary approach to understanding aging. And this is understood to be broader in its orientation than neurodegeneration or cancer biology or geriatric medicine. The view is, and geroscience is still very much in its early life, but I've seen in the journals over the last 10 years an extraordinary increase in the number of articles that will talk about geroscience. The idea is that if we can break down the barriers between chemistry and biochemistry and all these different fields that study basic biological issues, we will do, geroscientists will do for the understanding of aging what the creation of neurosciences 40 years ago as a field did for the understanding of the brain. So there's places that, such as the Buck Institute in California, which is, has broken down all the disciplinary barriers. They focus only on aging in all its aspects across disciplines. And the indication is that's what we need to be doing. A final point I'll make about how science and research has changed over time is, is captured in this uh, brief summary of a, of a statement, a quote, about moving from advocacy to partnership. And this photo is of Norma Drozdowicz, and when I was scientific director of the Institute of Aging, I, numbers of us felt it was really important to have the voice of older people on the advisory board for the Institute of Aging. And Norma is someone I've heard <coughs> present in Manitoba. She was chair of the Manitoba Council on Aging, and she was a member of our advisory board for a number of years. There was a point when she was talking to all these well-intentioned researchers around the table and said, you need to move from advocacy for older people to partnership with older people in the research that you're doing. Our voices need to be there. So this moving from advocacy to partnership is a very different way of thinking about the research that we do in aging, and I'm happy to have seen it develop over the last 10 to 15 years. So the binary. Many of you will know both of these examples. Uh, the first one from William uh, Hill, in, in, he lived in the, in the Victorian era and then into the 60s, born in the Victorian era, talks about the first one, very famous, it's, it captures both his wife and his mother-in-law. They're both depicted in there. And some of you will see the older woman sort of the side, the, 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 the younger woman, the side of her head sort of in profile. And you will also see the mother-in-law in the front, so the, the big gnomes bent over, etc. It's both. And the issue is, can you see both at the same time? Or can you just see one or the other? Similarly with the goblet, a very well-known image, you either see the faces of the two men facing one another, or you see the goblet. And I've drawn the analogy of the binary because that's how we often think about aging. It's this or it's this. 
when in fact, in many ways, the reality is somewhere in between. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next wee while. So uh, a sociology co colleague from the UK, Malcolm Johnson, has talked about the fact that when we look at how old age has been historically constructed, that there have been two global narratives about aging and old age, as he depicts them, one ancient, one modern. And he says that they're quite opposed in that, in one case, the notion of the elder revered, honored, respected through history. He will argue that that is actually somewhat over-idealized, it was never quite that good, but that imagery has been sustained for many centuries. The other image, the more modern one, is invokes the, the notion of apocalyptic demography. The sky is falling, the population is getting older. This is the worst thing that could have ever have happened to us. He talks about the promotion of the notions of generational conflict related to that, and a sense of panic that the population is actually aging. Two very contrasting images that, that Malcolm Johnson talks about. And I want to give you now a series. We're not going to talk about each of these because we, we cannot, but just a couple that come quickly to mind. So I've already alluded to homogeneity, taking everyone over 65 and lumping them all together, versus thinking about the nuances and differences of at least two generations over the age of 65. We can focus on the diseases that dominate later life or are associated with later life versus the processes of aging in which disease may or may not play a role. May not play a role at all to the very end of life in some ways. The, the concept of high tech, the future of how technology is going to actually help us with old age versus the more low tech, which many people will say is characteristic of true geriatric medicine. It's giving people time. It's actually taking the time. It's slow. It's the antithesis of what we think of as the high-tech world. The life expectancy, the drive to increase life expectancy versus focusing on healthy life years. We know that most of the years of life expectancy that women have beyond what men have are actually not healthy life years. So that's actually interesting. You know, my colleague uh, Ellen G once wrote, women get sick, but men die. Uh, you know, we've got different kinds of contracts going on there. We've got other ways of thinking this binary. One of, you, Betty, one of us has been to a physician, one problem at a time, versus multiple chronic conditions. Many people have multiple conditions, you can't isolate a single thing. In many cases, older people are seen as the source of the problem. Another way, and there are many examples from Sweden in terms of the way that dialysis is approached, for example, where or people are seen as the source of the solution, another way of thinking about it. The fantasy of the age, ageless society, the Methuselah Foundation, Aubrey de Grey, anyone who reads in that literature, that the first person to live to age 600 is already 60 years old. That notion that we can have the proverbial fountain of youth versus preparation for later life and having the societal supports to do so. Population aging as an apocalypse, as I've noted, versus societal achievement. The wrath of the boomers, the greedy gazers, versus the societal opportunity that we have actually had this number of people for the first time in history live this long. A contrast often with the, the, the hand wringing around, no pension plans for the future, versus recognizing that for many people in later life, unprecedented, unprecedented wealth and equity that we've never had as, as a society before. The, the control of discretionary spending, that this age group has different ways of thinking about it. And then finally, the epidemic of dementia versus healthier than ever, 70 is the new 50. Just trying to give you a sense of the contrasts that we see in the literature. I'll just skip that slide. So, so we know in terms of aging in the healthcare system, this is one of the main areas where aging is the bad person, right? Aging is going to, to bankrupt our healthcare system. And yet, if you read some of the work of my colleagues at UBC and the Center for Health Services and Policy Research, it is well documented that population aging itself is a relatively small factor in terms of the future increases and the current and the future increases in healthcare expenditures in Canada. It's there, but it's not the main one. Uh, my colleagues at Chesburgh, we call it, Center for Health Services and Policy Research, will argue that there are many ways in which our healthcare system is not managed on the basis of which expenditures generate the greatest health benefits. 
And if we actually took a hard look there, we'd see many different kinds of cost drivers. I'll allude to a few in a moment. And then the cost of inappropriate care and inefficiency in healthcare. It's larger than the impact of population aging in all the models looking into the future. Colleagues in Ottawa, colleagues in, in BC and other places doing this kind of analysis to try to tone down the rhetoric about the consequences of the aging of the population. Now this graph is one that's constantly referred to as evidence of how aging is actually driving up the cost of healthcare as we move forward. And you can see that for many of us, the highest costs that we will incur in our relationship to the healthcare system are in the first year of life and in the last year of our lives. For most of us, that's where the big expenditures are going to be. And because for most of us, the last year of our life is when we're, you know, in our 80s and 90s and beyond, that, that definitely has a relationship to how, we, how costs look. But this is an interesting graph because you can see, if you can see, see if I can the little, the little green bump on each, you can see, and I just took a random 10 year period, the data are very similar if you look more currently. But in each age period, you see the increase in the costs within each. So it's not just that they're, they're rising, but within each age group. That's telling us that there are other factors that are driving those costs in that way. And again, if you don't read Andre Picard in the Globe and Mail and his health column, I encourage you to do so. He's a thoughtful health reporter. He is quite insightful. And, and I, I, his, many of his um, uh, journal articles or, or newspaper clippings are actually in this one book, Matters of Life and Death, which came out a year or so ago. There's also some interesting work by Cassells called Selling Sickness. And some of the data that I'm talking about here come from Cassells. So both Picard and Cassells will talk about one of the great drivers of the increases in the healthcare system, what they call the technology epidemic. I am not a physician. I can't say whether the proliferation of MRIs and CT scanners is, is, is great. And that there are many, many, many cases where they're quite appropriate. But look at the rate of the increase in uh, looking at Canadian data, 70% increase in MRI scanners over a five year period. And we know the data from the United States show they often be used for routine things that actually don't require an MRI. CT scanners, a 36% increase over a five year period. Alberta Health released some data a couple of years ago where they focused in on bone density scans. And they said in 1994 they had 2,500, in 2000 they had 90,000. So a 26,000%, a 2,600% increase in a relatively short period of time in a procedure which has not been proven to prevent fractures. It's diagnostic, but it doesn't actually prevent. So that's cost. So it's looking at what it, where are you actually getting the benefit from the costs that you're, uh, you're incurring. Polypharmacy. We were sitting last night around the table talking about the number of medications that many older people take. And there are movements in Canada uh, and, and worldwide to actually have a more rigorous look at the number of medications people are taking. And a, a taking people off medication, in many cases, is deemed to be truly beneficial for them as they get older. And then alive inside, I briefly mentioned, in that video, there's a wonderful moment when um, Dr. Sachs, who just recently died, talks about the fact that in a long-term care facility, he could write out a prescription for medication, $1,000 worth of prescription medication for every person in that home, and no one would question it. But if he filled out a prescription for an iPod with music that actually meant something to a person and brought out that person who's alive inside instead of repressing it, uh, drugging them into oblivion. He, he couldn't do that. He could do one, but he couldn't do the other. What does our system say about the fact that we allow the pharmaceutical intervention and not an intervention that has actually been demonstrated to have positive benefits for many people? It is, you have to think about that. It, there's the continuum from people who are in a wheelchair and have disability at the end of their life to people like this woman who put their leg up a tree. And we have to think about that full reality, and we frequently don't. It's not a binary, it's not one or the other. It's that and everything that's in between that we have to consider when we talk about population aging. I don't know if any of you know this book by Dr. Seuss. Anybody know this book? 
No, no one knows this book. You're only old once. A book for obsolete children. So in there, he has a rather encouraging line. You're in pretty good shape for the shape you were in. I think we could all feel good about that. But what is interesting is, I, first I bought this book. Thinking, oh, this is a great, could be a gift for someone. A gift for their 80th birthday. Then I thought, no, I don't like it. Because throughout the book, being old represents and is cast as, characterized as, an intrusive and expensive interaction with the healthcare system. All the way through, that's what the book is about. That's how we tend to think of aging, right? Driving up costs in a system. So the challenges as we move forward with an aging population is really to think about disability life expectancy, how we can enhance that to the extent possible, increasing healthy life years, not just years of life, we talk a lot about compression of the period of illness before we die, so that the idea should be healthy, 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 get sick, fall off a cliff and die. If, instead of a long period of decline, which we often associate with aging. So we call this the compression of, mor of morbidity. Compression of morbidity. But what we have to increasingly recognize is that we do change as we get older. And this is a slide I like to show, because this man is 67. He's the age that I am now, and he's a pretty good looking specimen, isn't he? So, so this shows someone who's obviously robust, fit, looks after himself in all the ways that we are important. And this photo at 79, so 12 years later. Now it's a bit unfair because the camera angle is slightly different. A slightly different camera angle, right? You don't have exactly, it's a bit further away, so you don't have as up close. But you can see. Even for someone as fit as him, looking after himself, we do change. And we have to recognize that that's the reality of old age and later life. So uh, that's what we have to be to prepare for, to think about how do we support people as these kinds of changes occur in our physical selves. So I'll end this section with a focus on media, because I think we have to. We live in an era where we'll be talking a lot about media. So it's interesting. You'll often see interesting articles in newspapers I could have brought like, we could have spent the whole time just talking about media. So you might see things like Quest for Holiday, Quality Healthcare, The Economist, A Billion Shades of Grey, nice little play on words there. And then you'll see other, what I would call, less neutral depictions of aging. McLean's Pension Envy. Old, rich, spoiled. McLean's Why Boomers Are Doomed. You'll find the rhetoric, that kind of rhetoric about the apocalypse of aging everywhere you turn. So older people and social media, this is an interesting opportunity for select groups of older people to have a more direct voice in media than they've ever had before. So you'll see blogs by older people. Uh, I had done research on widowhood. You go in and you type, you can find blogs by people that go on for nine years. Really, really interesting. Reddit AMA, ask me anything. You want to turn 100 next week? Ask me anything. Those kinds of things. And Instagram. So this, this is Betty Love, age 101, and she actually kept a blog for 14 months so she could pass it down her thoughts or reflections on her life to her children and grandchildren. So that would be one kind of representation of later life by an older person. This is a summer she says on um, Lula. She says, I'm about to turn 100. I turn 100 next week. Ask me anything. So if you go on Reddit, you'll then find this is too small to read, and I couldn't make it larger because it was a screen grab. But this is actually someone writing to her, writes to her, because she says, my grandson is typing this for me. I turn 100 years old this Wednesday. I am mentally sharp and will answer almost anything you ask. So people ask her, like, what's your life been like? So you'll actually have a dialogue with a real person who you might not otherwise be able to access in terms of learning from an individual. What's it like to turn 100 years old? So these are interesting examples where you will actually have the opportunity to hear the voices of people themselves rather than filter through some of the media. And this is Batty Winkle. <laughs> now, do any of you know Batty Winkle? That Helen Winkle is her name. She has on her forehead Steely Your Man since 1926. <laughs> Batty Winkle is 90 years old. Um, my students introduced me to her. She's been an Instagram star since the age of 85. She has 3.8 million followers on Instagram. She is more famous than any one of us. 
more famous than any one of us will ever be. Now, she does that by being slightly iconoclastic. She doesn't, as you can see here, necessarily dress appropriate in a way we think is an age-appropriate way. She likes to be subversive. I've seen interviews with her on television, but I'm just saying it's interesting. You, you get older people who are recreating this imagery of what it's like to be very, very old. And Daddy Winkle is one of them. And she said, I like to be controversial. So we've got in media these contrasts that, that we need to be focused on. The serious, often apocalyptic language of, and perspective of many media. The high contrast, the conflict, generational conflict, old rich spoiled, boomers doomed. You can get a sense of that language. But you also get in, that, in these media reports real and observable implications of changing age structures. Japan is a fascinating example. The depopulation of rural areas of Japan. Communities simply fading away, people moving out. The, 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 what are the implications of migration, aging in rural areas, four different parts of the world? Just be one example of many. You also get social media, which sometimes gives you direct access to admittedly selective voices and images uh, of, of later life, but they give a very different portrayal often playful, resistant, sometimes age inappropriate and, and just decisively so, and insights. So really as we move forward and we think about media and the world of social representation, it's how do we balance both? That's what we need to think of. So if you don't recognize this person, some people in this room might. Uh, this was me, circa 1983. Uh, I tried to find one of me when I came to McMaster, but couldn't. But I like to look back, am I still that person? She's still me. And we know from Lynn and others, we see things not as they are, but as we are. So this is where I want to talk a little bit about this sort of personal journey, self-reflexive, etc. Some researchers will argue that there is now, even in, in social science and in research, a greater free play and more radically reflexive openness uh, that, that shapes the way we look at the world and what we write about. I've been very interested in the last couple of years, since my 65th birthday, in terms of how academic knowledge for me is affecting my understanding of my own age, and certainly my parents who recently died, that of others around me, and how personal experience can help us identify gaps in the insights we had in the past or the work that we've done. So there's been this emergence of what we call self-reflexivity in the field of gerontology. And many of us first became aware of the importance of this concept. A colleague, Gunhild Hagestad, had a cancer diagnosis back in 1996. And at that time, she felt that, that this likely signified the end of her life. So we talk a lot about notions of on time, off time, etc., in aging. And she talks about being out of time and what that means when you think you're out of time. So this was really one of the first examples, I know for me at least as a researcher, where I could see the real merit in having a really wonderful social scientist reflect on the meaning of time and later life. And in the last couple of years, it's been quite interesting to see the emergence of more journals talking and having issues, uh, uh, special issues, where they ask people who've researched aging all through their lives to reflect on their own aging, and then just a, a recent one in, in the last two years. So an interesting perspective, and I'm sure <coughs> that I know other colleagues here who know aging, there's many names there you would recognize. In terms of my own self-reflexivity, I was very reluctant, and I was surprised that I, would, I was reluctant to talk to my class after my 65th birthday to tell them how old I was. And uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Western Ontario said, oh, you should absolutely do that. You should. Uh, so in Vancouver, because our bus pass is a different color, if you're a senior citizen, <laughs> it's, which means the minute you whip out the bus pass, the secret is out. But uh, so it's orange. So I actually held up the bus pass. And I only felt moved and comfortable doing that when I was being seconded to Ottawa to the Daily Institute of Health Research in 2017. And I suddenly realized that students who planned to take the next class for me in the fall were going to see it wasn't on the syllabus anymore. And they were going to think, ooh, she died or she retired. So I better tell them, and I, and I actually phrased it as, I'm going off to Ottawa to the most demanding job I've ever had in my life. And that's what old people do. That's what we do. Okay. So 
More personally, I've also felt over the last number of years how my own family experiences have really shaped some of the writing, that my understanding of the writing I did before. So I had written about home care when I was still here in Ontario. Home care entered my family biography in 1998 when my mother had a stroke that left her paralyzed on one side for the remaining 14 years of her life. Sharpest attack, mentally quite alert, but it had needed assistance with everything from bathing to toileting, etc. She had to be lifted and transferred everywhere because of the paralysis that she had. We had home care come in to help out because mom lived at home. We, we built a house that was appropriate to her needs. And then I began to see things in my own experience as a daughter in a family that home care was entering regularly that I hadn't seen in the data that I'd written up before. And when I went back to the data, I found these issues there. Talked about some of the gender nature, nature of space, and the role of home care workers and family, that concept we share the care, which I published in this paper on, uh, in, in 2007. Really benefiting from thinking about what I'd written, what I, what I talked about. Ellen Ryan is here today. And Ellen, I had you on a slide before I knew you were going to be here. But Ellen, your own colleague, has talked about writing down our years, reflecting, writing narratives, the important role that they have in later life. Uh, colleague Victor Marshall, who was here at McMaster, has written a very interesting paper about the concept of life review and reminiscence. And as Victor says, people, when you get help through a social process in writing, you rewriting your autobiographies, you're more likely to develop a good story of your life. It's not just an internal psychological process, it's an engaged social process. And I'll just say quickly here, this article was never as good as I thought it was going to be, but the notion of ageism, prejudice against our fear of future selves. Interesting notion. Um, so into the future as we go, we, what are some of the challenges? I'll end in the next couple of minutes with this. Understanding deep old age, relatively few studies of 80 and over worldwide. Those studies, such as Newcastle, which have taken place, really emphasize the diversity of people over the age of 85. We get, we grow more unlike as we get older, not more alike. They talk about the increasing longevity, not necessarily being equated with very high disability or dependency, which you might think. Many people over the age, age of 85 are the survivors, and we need to think of them that way. And again, there's some wonderful work by Nir Barzilai in New York on centenarian you might be interested in. I had to mention the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging, based here at McMaster University, or down the road at McMaster University, a 20-year study following 51,000 Canadians. And uh, this is going to tell us about a range of issues in aging in a way that we haven't had that capacity in Canada before. So I'm encouraged by new developments in research. I think there, we also have to be aware of some of the challenges as we move forward. Well, Shansky and his colleagues talked about the rise in obesity, the rise in diabetes. We may, for the first time in history, have what they call a bifurcation. Uh, more people, many people will live longer than their parents did, but many people, for these reasons, will not live as long. And historically, that's been very different. And then, of course, we've got the emergence of new threats like antimicrobial resistance. What is that going to do to aging as we move into the future? We have challenges and opportunities as well. New book on the 100-year life. If we all think about our aging and we're planning for living to 80, into our 80s or into our 90s, how does it change things if we actually start to think about planning to live to 100? Just in terms of the resources we need, the social supports, the economic resources. This is an article about working until you're 100. I don't know, many of us would want to do that, but that is an issue. And of course, I mentioned at the Einstein Medical Center in New York, super centenarians, and one man featured in that work, Irving, goes to work three times a week at the age of 104. Uh, whether that's a good thing for you or not. So, the, but lots of the areas where we do research in aging, they're not attractive, they're not getting some of the attention that I think that they need. And one of them is an issue that we know was one of the best guarantees of remaining independent. Mobility. Keeping moving. And all the research is telling us how important mobility is. So you can see significant numbers of people over the age of 80 have mobility impairments, hip fractures, the, the recovery rate is poor, we have advances in assistive devices, and yet we're not putting the resources into there that we're putting in, say, to dementia, and I would argue we need to be doing more of that. 
We need to be thinking more about walkability, accessibility, the appropriateness of environments. There are many countries of the world that can teach us how do you actually build the physical space that we move through in a way that enhances mobility. Put the words back to the future here because I think we're starting to do some of these things. I took a picture just last week. This the wooden staircase is in the new alumni center of the University of British Columbia. Beautiful open staircase. After for many of us decades where you went into a public building, you couldn't find the stairs even if you wanted them because the elevator was front and center. So there's a new movement, and you see with staircases like these in public buildings, to get people moving, to invite physical activity. A couple of new books by Canadian colleagues. Brett Finley writing about the whole body microbiome. The argument there is, it's not just what goes on in the brain that affects things like dementia. It's what we eat, it's our gut. And some colleagues are suggesting that if we even started to brush three times a day instead of two, we would increase the likelihood of dementia or not. He talks about that in this book. Antoine Akeem, another fine Canadian researcher and scholar on stroke. Uh, really, really interesting work. So, um, big issues as we move forward. We can talk about this in the Q&A afterward if you like. I think home and community care and where we live, our housing, our co-housing, housing cooperatives, those are some of the big issues as we move forward. Those are the issues we're going to have to address as we all age. So changing social context, I haven't talked about any of these, but again, we, you may want to discuss them. The role of agency of older people, thinking of us as architects of a lot of what happens to us. Inequalities, I haven't focused on that. I haven't focused on diversity and the fact of the great diversity, ethnocultural diversity in the Canadian population. Some argue that we have more risk in our society now, the way we structure pensions and, and, uh, and income in later life, that we've moved from the vulnerable to the venerable, uh, the venerable to the vulnerable in terms of how we think of aging. We know families have changed, they're smaller, they're longer, they're more generations, and then the going so low. More people live alone today than have ever done so in Canadian society. The 2016 census for the first time had more single family households in Canada than couple households. The first time historically. 30% of Canadians live alone. That's a threefold increase in 50 years. We don't know what this means going forward, the isolation. We know we have a Minister for Loneliness in the United Kingdom. Not all these people are lonely. You can't equate living alone with lonely, but they're interesting social indicators. So if you've got nothing out of the last 50 minutes or so a day, <laughs> how has the time you have spent listening to me affected your life expectancy? Because it has. So Tom Kirkwood, who's a colleague from the UK, a, a, bi a biological scientist, has written a book or an article called Why Can't We Live Forever in the Scientific American. And they've done a cal he's done a calculation that every day we gain five hours when we've lived as long as we have. We're gain, actually gaining five hours because we're, we're the survivors. If we didn't die in childhood, we got through all those diseases that people can die of earlier in life. So if you've got nothing else to do with the math, probably gain about 10 minutes when you get to that. <laughs> so remember that line from Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other? That's what you've got here. You've got two very different representations of aging. So usually when I talk to a group, I end with this slide, but I've got another slide to show you. This is, I took one of these, the, the picture in yellow is outside a hotel I was in in New Zealand, and the other was taken in Europe. Very different representations. Again, I say I don't know what they're supposed to signify. Is it like this is the driving hazard up ahead, or what is it? <laughs> so I actually went online. I couldn't Google anything, and I Googled this last week. And I discovered there had recently been a campaign in the UK, literally May the 8th or May the 11th, 2019, the Telegraph, uh, Daily Telegraph in the United Kingdom, had like a competition to say, are these ageist? What do you think? Are there alternative signs we could have? So here they are. So here's one. <laughs> so this is by the people who created the, you know, the children running by the school, so they come up with a new version of that. Here's another. OLD or danger, what is that one say? Older and badly for next two years. Snail, this is supposed to depict walking more slowly. Here's another, with different kinds of hairdos. I think you'd see Abbey Road, Disco Ball. 
So these are all different ways of depicting how the future is aging. So you can decide which one you like, but nevertheless, the future is aging. Thank you very much.